Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Rogers, and I'm the director of the Texas Heart Institute at Baylor College of Medicine. And I'm joined in the studio today by Matt Maurer, who just gave a wonderful talk on on amyloidosis and cardiac amyloidosis in particular, yeah. and sort of walked us through um, your not only your approach, which I think is so I think the world is following, but really a very forward-looking view into some of the therapies. So Matt, we're just um, so happy that you took the time to join us here at Texas Heart. Great to be here, and uh, we're old friends, so I really appreciate the invite. It's great to see old people, and really a fantastic place you've uh, created here. Uh, and I mean, you're kind. Keep shepherding forward, so. Thank you. So th the purpose of this is just to sort of take what we discussed in the last hour and make yeah. it very practical. Yeah. Uh, and so there were some things that really struck me that I wanted to just explore further from your talk. Yeah. And, and I guess what I'd like to do is start with this idea of, of an evaluation of a patient who comes to you with a presumptive diagnosis of amyloid. And, and would you just, I mean, you probably have one of the largest experiences in the world, and, but you have a very methodical way of thinking through the diagnostic algorithm. So could you just walk through it, that patient from the, like when, the, when you first walk in the room, what are the things you're asking what are the things you're looking for and what are the tests that you're doing yeah. to make sure that you've got the diagnosis right? Yeah, well, I think one of the main things I was trying to communicate is the perceptions. This is a you know, very rare condition. And um, for those who don't know, the fastest growing segment in the U.S. and worldwide population are people, believe it or not, over the age of 75 who are you know, disproportionately afflicted by this. So I think everyone's um, going to experience this in clinical cardiology and general medicine. Um, the sine qua non is usually patients have um, an increased wall thickness on their echocardiogram or some imaging that prompts people to think of this particular condition. So are the, a lot of the people that you're seeing oftentimes being sent because they have unexplained or unexplainable left ventricular hypertrophy? Not anymore for us. I mean, we used to see a lot of those patients and back to the diagnostic algorithm, it would be that, you know, someone thought of the condition or they had certain subtle symptoms and, um, you know, again, increased wall thickness, maybe many of the orthopedic manifestations I mentioned previously, carpal tunnel, lumbar spinal stenosis, a biceps tendon rupture. Um, so often they had biomarkers that were out of proportion to their clinical syndrome, so they'd have a, you know, NT pro B and P that was way higher than you would expected, and or they had a troponin leak for years, yeah. went to went a bunch of cardiac catheterizations that didn't show coronary disease. Those are some of the clues in some regard. And once you raise the suspicion of the diagnosis, the algorithm is is really um, very simple. It's uh, A, exclude light chain amyloidosis. That is still an ultra rare disease. I mean, mm -hmm. literally there are like 4,000 patients diagnosed in the U.S. every year. And so even if you know, people live you know, 10, 15 years, there's, there's not a lot of people with that condition, but you must exclude it because it's so malignant. And it's excluded with essentially three blood tests, uh, serum free light chain assay, not a total light chain assay, but mm -hmm. a kappa lambda free light chain assay which has a very high sensitivity, like 92% for diagnosing the substrate for AL amyloid. And then a serum immunofixation electrophoresis and a urine spot immunofixation. The key here is not to order an S-PEP, mm -hmm. but rather what we call an S-PI. Ask the lab to look for small monoclonal proteins. And the combination of those three tests has like a 99% sensitivity for basically saying, does this patient have the substrate for AL amyloid? If they don't, then they can't have AL amyloid, then you uh, basically do PYP scan, and if it's positive, it's 100% specific for TTR, and then you genotype them. If they have monoclonal proteins, then the PYP scan is not 100% specific. And in those circumstances, you have to kind of see who you're talking about. If you have a 100-year-old patient in front of you, uh, to be honest, you know, they may be a little reluctant appropriately to have a biopsy. The chances are they still have age-related wild type with a monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, right. not AL amyloid. <laughs> yeah. And so, to be honest, you're 95% certain, you're not 100% specific, and you have a conversation. But in some patients, you really do need, you know, a, a younger individual who could be at risk for AL looks much sicker, then you really do need to go on to tissue biopsy. And are you working then closely with, with hematology or hematology, oncology, yeah. for those sort of patients that, are, that overlap and... Absolutely. And, I mean, I have a... I didn't show it today, but I have a slide of all the, you know, um, chemotherapeutic agents, and oncologists get a new drug approved like every week, you know, like <laughs> it seems. Um, and so, um, 
you know, you need an expert individual, not just a myeloma doctor, but someone who takes care of light chain amyloidosis to uh, guide therapy. There are a whole host of anti-plasma cell therapies. I, the slide's titled something like, don't do this alone. You know, you really need to get a colleague. But they're wonderful and really helpful. Does echo fit into that algorithm? Yeah, I mean, echo is uh, one of the things that raises the suspicion of the diagnosis. But th not necessarily... I guess it is a critical component. Probably. It's a good critical, but it's not going to tell you, like someone was asking today, well, how do you distinguish AL or TTR? It's still back to the monoclonal proteins, yep. tissue analysis, or the scintigraphy. Neither echo or MRI is going to tell you which type you have. But they raise the suspicion quite a bit. And, you know, MRI in particular, I think people have uh, cardiomyopathies that have been undefined for years, and someone finally just orders an MRI, and the conclusion basically says, you know, high ECV, a lot of delayed enhancement, think amyloid. Yeah. Usually the providers kind of, I call a peek and squeak test. They peek at it and they squeak because <laughs> they feel like, oh my God, I missed the diagnosis, and they refer right. the patient in for further evaluation. Now you, you made the other point, you've made a couple of other points in the diagnostic algorithm that I'd love to just explore a little bit more. You talk about doing genotyping. Yeah. How do you use the genotyping clinically or prognostically? Great question. So a g patients who have variant disease or you know, have a, a genetic cause, they do have a worse prognosis, it's pretty clear. And the disease progresses at a faster rate. They usually have, uh, they're usually manifest at a, a younger age, about five or 10 years younger. So genotyping right now is important for that, prognosticating. It's also important right today, it may not be in a month or so <laughs> if Vitrusaran's approved, but right now it's essential to get access to silencer-based therapy. So uh, stabilizers, tefaminus, acaraminus were approved for uh, cardiomyopathy um, but not, um, and, and neuropathy, but silencers right now today are only approved for patients who have variant disease. They have to have a genetic variation and a neuropathy. They can have a cardiomyopathy, but if they don't have the first two, variant and a neuropathy, they're not eligible. Yeah. Um, and and you, you made the point uh, at the end of your talk about family screening when you identify a genetic yeah. abnormality. You sort of said, well, I'd be much more worried about the SIBs yeah. than I would be about the kids. Uh, yeah, because this is a disease that has what's called an age-dependent penetrance. So you're born with the gene, but there's no one at the age of three, four, and five, or even 20 or 30 who has you know, TTR amyloid. We'll get um, an example. We'll get someone calling us and saying, you know, there's a young kid. He has a thick-walled heart. He had renal transplant. He's been on cyclosporin. His heart's thick, and he's 25. And the answer is, he just carries a gene that's not causing his phenotype. It doesn't happen at that age. Right. The, we used to say to people it was a disease that penetrated after the age of 60 in men, 70 in women. We're probably a little wrong. It may show up a little bit earlier. So the point here is if you have a patient who is affected, they're very worried about their kids, which I understand and we try to explain to them. You can be, but the real people they should be worried about are their siblings who are the same age who are at marked increased risk for having disease. Now, the other thing that you had in your diagnostic algorithm was biopsy. Yeah. How does biopsy fit into this larger sort of ecosystem of tests that you're doing to either rule in or rule out? Oh, it's still PTR. very important. I tried to make the point like, uh, you know, surrogate biopsies, fat pad or other things are reasonable, but you can't stop the workup with those if you still have a high clinical suspicion because they're not very sensitive. Yeah. And, you know, people need to be able to call on a center like this to be able to get an endomyocardial vibe still has an important role to play, especially in someone who has monoclonal proteins and you suspect light chain amyloid, then the only way to definitively separate out the two, you're not going to use a scintigraphy, you're not going to use an echo or an MRI, is to look at the tissue and actually do what they call mass spectrometry, which is to kind of identify what the precursor protein is. And as I highlighted, still, you know, it varies, but 10, 15, 20 percent of our patients still need an endomyocardial biopsy. Yeah. Um, and they need the expertise of a center that does enough of them so that um, there's no trouble when they're doing that. I always was struck by um, our colleagues who said, well, I think this person might have amyloid. It looks like it might be amyloid in the heart. I'm not entirely sure. So let's do a fat biopsy, yeah. <laughs> a fat pad biopsy. I always thought it's sort of like Willie Sutton. Yeah, exactly. You know, the bank robber. Totally. It's like, why do you rob a bank? Because that's where the money is. I think yeah, the biopsy I, the heart. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> that's where you think. That's what I do. I, you know, our hematologist will do fat pad biopsies, and it's great if they're positive, but if they're negative, um, they often will call yeah. us and ask for an And again, an endomyocardial biopsy, you and I know, is, is really not that big a deal. My point was, an amyloid with a thick-walled heart, you'd have to really work hard at causing a big problem. You know, like, it's not something I've ever seen. There was one other question that was asked uh, online uh, at the end of your talk, and we didn't have a chance to get to it, but I'd love to get your yeah. understanding. And it has to do with the natural history 
of amyloid. Somebody asked the question like, why do people get wild type amyloid later in life? Like, yeah. wh wh why does the tetramer begin unfolding yeah. or breaking into, into you know, smaller fragments as we get older? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. And to be honest, the biology of wild type TTR is not entirely clear. I mean, we publish data, which surprises people. Um, in that uh, Jeff Kelly, who invented tefamastilp, an assay to measure stability. Um, TTR stability in older adults is no different in those who have disease than those who don't. I hate to be alarmist, but everyone's TTR is falling apart. Yeah. So it's probably something to do with the body's ability to handle misfolded proteins yeah. in these particular circumstances. Um, we have a, a grant, we'll see if it gets funded, but um, there's a phenomenon called loss of Y. So as men, me, you, everyone ages, we lose our Y chromosome, and loss of Y is disproportionately higher, we found, in patients with wild-type TTR. And it could be that there's genes on the Y chromosome that handle misfolded proteins. And so we've been all very TTR-focused, but I was trying to make the point that for those getting into the field, we would love to have a bedside blood <laughs> test that could tell us who's handling proteins well and who isn't. We don't have that yet. Listen, again, I just want to thank you Pleasure this to is be a here. great, great chance to just sit down and explore a couple of other issues. And, and thanks again for coming to, to Houston today and My wish pleasure, you a safe really. journey home. Yeah, great.